Okay, well, uh, thanks everyone for staying late and uh, joining me for this presentation that's about imagining a better functional programming developer experience. Uh, I'm James Ward, I'm a developer advocate at Google Cloud. Um, so I want to start out by acknowledging two of my coworkers from Google, or they were at Google, uh, Ray Sang and Yana Dogan, who uh, actually contributed to a lot of the content that I'm gonna go through around developer experience, so thanks to them. All right, so what is developer experience? Uh, it's an interesting question to, to start with. Uh, experience in the dictionary, the good old, let's refer to the dictionary, is an experience is practical contact with an observation of facts or events. So what does that look like with developer experience? Well, there's lots of places where we have contact with things, where we observe things, where we need to work with things. Uh, we can be setting up and configuring a service, uh, setting up and configuring a Kafka Zia library. We can be using a library, reading documentation. We can be troubleshooting problems, making something work. Uh, so there's lots of places as developers where we experience things. and. Uh, the question that I want to focus on more is, what is a good developer experience? This is a bad developer experience, as I'm sure many of you have experienced. I did get it working, so that was, you know, good, but, um, but that was not fun. And I've had, I've had some that are way worse than this, you know, just try, try to get that CI system uh, working over and over and over again. Here's a pretty good developer experience. I don't know if you've ever used AirProne, but it's a nice thing that looks at your Java code and says, hey, you might have bugs. And then it, the really cool thing that I like about this is that it gives you a URL to the place to go to get more information about why that's a potential bug. Um, I, being a Scala developer, prefer to just put as much of that into the type system as possible, let the compiler do that for me, but um, certainly this is a better developer experience than, than uh, you could have without it. Uh, this is a terrible developer experience because every time I go and download Node, I have to go look up how to extract an X, uh, XZ file. It's like, XZ, come on, like GZ I know, but XZ, I have no idea. And I actually looked at the stats on Google Trends, and as soon as Node switched over to XZ as the default uh, com compression format, the searches for how to extract an XZ file like just skyrocketed. And so that's a terrible developer experience. They should just use something familiar to us. Um, I, having spent a lot of time in the Java ecosystem, uh, I really appreciate what the Spring folks have done with start.spring.io, and now many of the other uh, sites have something similar to get people bootstrapped in new projects and, and help people get started. So I think that's a, a pretty good developer experience. So all the stuff, uh, all these examples, developer experience, what, what is it? Well, one way that we can talk about developer experience is, oh, it feels good, it feels nice, it feels horrible, feels difficult, feels. It's all feels, right? Developer experience is just how we feel. Well, I actually think that we can measure developer experience, that we can actually take those things away from the realms of feelings and move them into the realm of something we can measure, something we can optimize and make better in a more rational way. And so that's what I wanna go through is the framework that I use to think about how to make developer experience better. So when I say that we can measure developer experience, what I'm really saying is that what developer experience is all about is productivity. That is, that is the underlying idea behind all developer experience and all good developer experience is that really what we're trying to do is be more productive. We're trying to get our job done faster, uh, get to our goal faster. So, what we can look at productivity as is a function of value over time. So value is like, you know, what am I, what am I trying to achieve? It's uh, I want to reach my goals, I want to finish my project, get more than I expected. Time, of course, is we're trying to optimize the amount of time, invest less time, but get more value. So better developer experiences are those that give us more value and less time. Uh, but this is a ratio, and so this is where it's important is because sometimes we think like developer experience may just be uh, giving you like, like one super quick way to do something like start.spring.io, and that may not actually be the most optimal developer experience because maybe the value that somebody gets in what they can do in five minutes 
isn't a whole lot of value. And so we need to think about it as this ratio that, that yeah, you know, it's great to provide simple ways to do things, but we also have to be providing value. And if we're not providing value, then uh, in that amount of time, if we're not optimizing that, that equation, then we're not providing a good developer experience. So this is measurable, and uh, I have uh, four different ways that we can measure developer experiences and uh, so that we can then know what to optimize for. So I want to go through those. So the first principle is that principle one, uh, respect developers' knowledge and goals. And so building developer experiences, uh, we need to think about who we're building them for and what their goals are. So let's talk about some non-goals. So uh, it's oftentimes as developers, and, and I'm certainly guilty of this many times, is that I uh, think about the goals of being, uh, of what the developer is trying to do as being like the steps that they need to do to get somewhere, not in term, and not in terms of what they're actually trying to do. And so an example of this is uh, as a developer, I want to. I want to create five uh, files from scratch without an IDE, then install Docker, then start the Docker daemon, then install a CLI, then install a build tool, then create a container, then copy and paste some commands. And if you look at a lot of guides on the internet about how to use, in this case, like a, a, some cloud technology, this is what they tell you to do. This is this. And, this is not the goal. Those steps are not the goal, but oftentimes we think, oh, the developer is trying to create a container. No, they're not trying to create a container. That's not their goal. Their goal is to get something running on the internet. Um, but, you know, I've, uh, so that, I don't know, I've forgotten at this point uh, what I was even trying to accomplish because there was so many things going on there. So when we think about goals, we need to think about what the, the developer is actually trying to accomplish. Oftentimes, you can look at that through a lens of what the business needs, what the business goals are, uh, or you know, uh, not the actual steps that the developer has to take to maybe get there given a set of technology. So when we think about things as goals, uh, one of the, the ones that I uh, focus on being in cloud is I want to allow developers to kick the tires of Google Cloud and do that in as few steps and as easily as possible. So getting a lot of value uh, in a short amount of time uh, to just try the cloud out. And I want to show you uh, this thing that I built to do that. So I'm going to go to this repo here. This is my Hello Netcat repo. It is a server in a Docker file, which is kind of fascinating if you're interested in servers written in Docker files. Uh, but that's not what I want to show you. What I want to show you is that I can take this Git repo and I can hit this Run on Google Cloud button. And yes, I do trust my repo because I built it. Uh, so I'm going to confirm that. So what this is going to do is take that repo and deploy it onto Google Cloud. And I only have to answer a couple questions. One, I trust the repo. Another one, I'm going to authorize this thing to make some API calls on my behalf. I want to use my JW demo project. And then it's going to walk through everything that is needed to get this thing up and running. I do have to specify the region that I want to deploy in. But there we go, now it's running the Docker build and that will build the container image and push it to the container registry. Uh, and so I didn't have to type in any commands, now it's deploying it onto Cloud Run. And so all those steps just happened for me. So as somebody who my goal is just to see how something is gonna work on the cloud, I don't wanna think about all the steps that I have to go through in order to do that. I just want to have this push button, click experience, and there we go, my app is now up and running on the cloud. Hello world, yay, there's my server. So that was a pretty short amount of time, and I wouldn't say like a ton of value. Uh, there, you know, you can use that Cloud Run button on other repos that may have more value, but, but uh, the, the value is pretty minimal, but also the time was pretty minimal on that. And hopefully, uh, this is a learning tool, so we actually output the commands that the, that the user would normally have to copy and paste or run themselves, and so that the user can learn about the steps that were needed to, to actually get to their destination. Okay, so that's one example I want to show you is Cloud Run Button, which is kind of cool. Uh, but let's talk about some other goals. So uh, I think a big goal for me is consistency. I try uh, really hard to create consistent builds, consistent development environments, because this is where a lot of bugs come up, is the it, it works on my machine kind of thing. And so one of the things that I love 
uh, is, to do this is build wrappers. Uh, I really do not like it when when a you onboard onto a new project and it's like, okay, now you got to go download Maven or download Gradle or download SBT or whatever it is. Uh, I like to have launchers that download the right version for me and so that I get consistency of builds. And the one that I think is doing a really good job of this is actually Gradle. And so I'm going to go over to uh, Gradle project here. Um, this is my neat toolchain one. So uh, the Gradle launcher, it has the uh, shell script, or this one, shell script and the bat script to launch Gradle, and it downloads Gradle if I don't have the version that, that is needed. That's specified in a, in a file in, in the Gradle directory. But now I can say Gradle W and you know, run my task. And, uh, and that, is, that is great for providing consistency of the build tool versions. Uh, and of course you can do this with SBT, although the SBT launchers uh, are a little bit um, wonky in some ways. But um, Gradle's done a great job with this and I and, uh, think, think that uh, there's also Maven wrapper. So pretty common now to have these wrappers. But there is another one that I want to go over which is Toolchains, which is newer in, uh, in the Gradle ecosystem. So I'm going to pull up this project in IntelliJ. And what I can do in my Gradle build is specify the Java toolchain and set the language version to whatever version I want. And what now Gradle will do when I go in and actually try to run my application, oh, let me show you what the application is. So if we go check out my neat application, this one, uh, we can see I'm just outputting the Java version that we're running with. So that's my very fancy application. But let's go try to run this thing. So when I run it, we see that, sure enough, it ran with, with Java 17. Uh, if we check out my Java version, uh, one dash, this is a bad developer experience right there, that one dash, that's, that one's. Uh, okay, so I, my system JVM is 11, but it, this Java program ran with, with 17. Uh, and then also, we can go and check out the class files for this thing, and we go open that up, we'll see that sure enough, it was even compiled with Java 17, like I'd expect. So, um, so I, I love that Gradle is doing this, managing that tool chain so that we don't have to think about uh, the consistency of the tool chain uh, and would, would love, I wish I had time to put this kind of support into SBT, um, but, but Gradle's doing a great job with, with uh, what they did there. Um, okay, there's one interesting lack of consistency that drives me crazy, which is the lack of consistency between a build and an IDE. And this is something that I wish IntelliJ, IntelliJ has been getting a little bit better at, but still is not perfect. And I'm going to illustrate this uh, inconsistency to you by trying to run my application in IntelliJ. And we will see that, oh, I get a linkage error because uh, IntelliJ doesn't know about the tool chain. They haven't added in the, the tool chain support yet in IntelliJ. So IntelliJ thinks I'm using my system JDK 11, but I'm not. And so that is a lack of consistency between the IDE and the build definition, which is unfortunate. And hopefully they get that fixed at some point. Okay, so that is um, about the uh, build wrappers, tool chains. Uh, the next one I want to go into on this one is test containers. Uh, who all here is using test containers? Okay, good, good. Those of you that aren't, this is like one of the best things to happen since, since uh, Scala itself. Um, I love test containers and I want to show it to you real quick. So, um, so test containers, what it's about is it's taking our Docker service dependencies like Kafka, like Postgres, whatever, Cassandra, and it is, instead of managing those through Docker, Docker Compose, something like that, you manage them as just part of your build definition. So I've got, uh, I'm doing this one in Kotlin, sorry, I didn't have time to, uh, to, to port this over to a good Scala application. But what I can do is, let's go take a look at the, um, the build definition for this project. I have a dependency on the Postgres test container for this project, and so this now allows me to use the Postgres Docker container and the life cycle of that Docker container is uh, either can be managed manually or automatically. And there's a few different ways that you can do that. So now the way that I do my integration tests is I do my integration tests against my test container. And I can choose, do I want my whole suite to use a single Postgres instance? Do I want to use a Postgres instance per test? 
Uh, they deal with the port randomization, so if I want to run stuff in parallel, I can. Uh, there's all sorts of great stuff about uh, using test containers. The one little nasty thing is that I, I do, in, in this case, this is a Spring Boot application, I do have to manually uh, specify the lifecycle and the, the way to map the configuration for my test container into my, my service that I'm going to be using. Uh, there is, I wanted to show you, um, Eigel has a example of doing this in, in uh, Scala Zio layers. So, um, so not, too, not too bad to do, but that is the one downside of, of test containers is having to do that mapping. Corcus has actually done a really good job of building some tooling around this. And now, uh, if you've ever used Play Framework, you may remember that you would start your Play application and your play application would, if you're using a database, it would start the database for you, and then play has this auto reload feature. Well, it wouldn't reload the database when you were just making code changes, and that was really nice for productivity. You know, you're working on your application, and, and you don't want to be constantly reloading that service, but you do want to be reloading your code in the actual application. And so Corcus has actually done that exact same experience, but on top of test containers. So that's a super nice thing that, that they um, that they have that doesn't yet exist in the Scala world as far as I know. Okay, so let's uh, go actually use our test container. So I'm going to run a Gradle test, and when I do that, uh, it's going to, um, my application will say, oh, you need a Postgres database, and so it's gonna go off, use the test container, start up the test container for Postgres, you'll see that starting. Uh, it is starting in the local Docker daemon, so that is one of the downsides of test containers, except for there is now a company behind test containers called Atomic Jar, and they have a cloud service. So if you don't want to or can't run a local Docker daemon for your test containers, you can use their cloud service, and everything just runs on their cloud service. So uh, there is a way around that, and super exciting to, to have, have that new business spinning up. Okay, so great. My, my uh, test container spun up my integration test that was talking to the database ran and passed, so that's all good. But also, in this case, I have wired up this thing so that when I run boot run to start my Spring Boot application, uh, what it will do is also start up the Postgres test container, and so that then I can go do my local development against that test container as well. So there we go, starting up and listening. So if we go to localhost 8080, then we can see that, sure enough, my database works, and great. So that's what I do in, uh, for my developer experience, and pretty much everything I build now is I use test containers for my service dependencies, and I use them if I have a server that I'm, I'm running, then I start up the test container uh, and uh, manage that, use, use the test container for like that kind of development, and then also for my integration tests. You, and then it would, of course, use this from your uh, continuous integration system, use the same ones. So this consistency, what it's doing is providing us consistency of service dependencies, because now you can make sure that if you, the version of Postgres that you're using for local dev and local test and CI is the same one that you're using for production. And that is a super nice thing to have consistency there. Okay, next goal that I think about uh, a lot is discoverability. So uh, as a developer, um, I uh, have really gotten addicted to IDEs. I unfortunately don't write much code in VI anymore um, because the IDE has just become so helpful. And so uh, I think a lot of developers are in that same boat where they are using an IDE to help them get through writing code. And so I think for discoverability at this point, we should be optimizing for dot completion in our APIs and making sure that when somebody hits that dot, that what shows up is what they expect to show up and what they search for in that list uh, comes up uh, under the, the terms that they're looking for. But naming is hard. Uh, there's been some uh, Twitter banter lately around the word filter and that filter is um, maybe not the best name to describe something that applies a filter. Some, it can be hard to know, is the filter keeping the things or removing the things, and um, people get a little bit lost in that. So maybe there are names that are not great names, but naming is hard, and part of the reason why naming is hard is because change is hard. Maybe we would like to change the name filter, uh, but that means an API change, and, and so uh, it can be hard to, to move forward onto new APIs and map old code to the new API code, and so we generally just don't change names. 
uh, and we'll talk about some, some ways that hopefully we'll be, deal with that better in a little bit. Um, but uh, the, I think one of the key points uh, to this, that naming is hard and change is hard, is that we have to figure out this balance between naming things for uh, what's familiar and naming things in a better way. And so one way that I like to think about that is that really try to focus more on internal consistency than consistency with the external world, uh, that that's more important. Both are important, but what's more important is, is the internal consistency. So an example of this is I think it's in Kotlin, where when you want to write to the console, it's print lin, lowercase l, and when you want to read from the console, it's read line with the uppercase l, and I'm like, oh, that's just, uh, that is not consistent. So. Try to opt, in this case, I would certainly try to, to um, if I was in charge of the APIs, I would make a change. Uh, of course, that would be a breaking change, but that would, um, just to create the consistency there. So even though Printlin may be familiar to Java developers, I think it'd be better because we uh, optimize for dot completion if we did print line in this case, something like that. And thankfully, Zio 2 has much better consistency around naming in that particular example. Uh, discoverability with type classes is painful, and uh, John DeGos has a great talk if you want to dive into more details on that. But, um, but I, um, type classes is one of those things where I like the idea, and, uh, and there's so much wonderfulness there, um, but teachability and discoverability of type classes is challenging. So, um, okay. So how do we measure this? So we talked about some uh, the, the first principle to respect the developer's knowledge and goals, but how do, we, how do we actually measure this? So one way to not measure it is to ask people to rate their experience. Uh, and the reason why that is a bad way to measure this is because uh, we don't know what was bad or good about it when we just tell someone to rate their experience. So instead, we should ask questions like, was this experience consistent with the way I do things? Or did this experience help you learn something useful or solve your problem? Those are good questions that, that if you want to create a better developer experience, this will tell you how you're doing on the first principle of respecting your developer's knowledge and goals. Okay, so that was the first principle. Go through the, the second one now, which is do the simplest thing that could possibly work. So uh, we've all, uh, I have built many Rube Goldberg machines in my, my days, uh, building, uh, building systems. Um, and I love, I'm gonna open this, this tweet up. This just to me sums up um, the experience that, that I think many of us have many times a day, a, a week. Uh, okay, so the build succeeded, and then just closing Stack Overflow tabs. <laughs> like, that, that is, like, that happens to me all the time. It's like, like, it doesn't seem like this person, uh, they were very, you know, they had to open a lot of different, different tabs to, to be able to solve their goal. And I have this experience all the time. This is indicative of something not being the simplest thing that could possibly work. Um, so, uh, so yeah, hopefully we can go the other direction and, uh, and build experiences that are the simplest thing that could possibly work. So uh, on my flight over uh, from Colorado, I started creating something that is uh, very early. Oops, I want to move that. Let's just go type it in here. I started creating this start.zo.dev. And uh, it's, it's bare bones, it, but some things don't work yet, uh, but I've only been at this for, for a, a few hours. And so this is the simplest thing that could possibly work for being able to bootstrap a new Zio application. And so I'm going to pick my archetype. Right now we have two archetypes, CLI and REST. And then I get to specify some options, like I want Scala 3 and Zio 2. And so then I hit download, and the zip file for that project downloads to my machine. And, oh, we get a nice question here. Does this project give you, what you need, give you what you need to get started? Yes or no, which isn't hooked up to anything yet. Uh, but here's a nice little DX thing, is if somebody hits that no button, ask them to file an issue. Provide some more details on, on uh, what, what went wrong there, uh, what wasn't what they expected it to be. 
Okay, so let's go take a look at my project that, uh, that I just downloaded so you can see that, that sure enough, this hopefully will all work. Uh, let's unzip that project. Oh, another important thing, which is that we get instructions. So, um, so it's important, uh, we'll get it, actually, I'll come back to that one later, jumping a, ahead to, to the next principle. Um, let's, let's go unzip this, this thing, uh, which is over. WSL is, um, is it's better than, than uh, Sigwin, but it's not, um, not as awesome as just Linux, which is what I usually use, but do not um, present on Linux because who knows what's gonna happen. Okay, uh, okay, I've unzipped my CLI application and now uh, I get my SBT launcher so I can come in and launch SBT and uh, of course that'll download SBT. Won't download the, the right JVM for me um, like Gradle did, but hey, at least it downloads SBT. And then I can run my CLI application and that will compile and then we should see our fancy hello world. We can run our tests and see that our tests pass, yay. Uh, and then of course we can open our, that project up into our IDE, which I'm gonna skip that. Um, but you can go check it out, start.zo.dev, and, uh, and hopefully we can improve this, make this better, and, and uh, rebuild the UI in Laminar uh, is, is high on the list of, of to-dos. Uh, so, um, okay. So that is a developer experience, hopefully, that is helping developers to, or will help developers to bootstrap their Zio projects, go from zero to 60 in less than five minutes. That's, that's really my, I'd like to apply a five minute test to a lot of uh, getting started experiences. If most getting started experiences for me like end up taking hours and hours, and I'm like, figure out how to reduce that down so that I can be successful. I can be writing code if that's if I'm starting a new project in five minutes. And that would be my goal with start.zio.dev is to allow people to get started writing code, being productive in five minutes. Okay, another thing that um, I love that's happening in the Scala ecosystem around this principle of doing the simplest thing that could possibly work is syntactic sugar. Uh, there is some wonderful syntactic sugar uh, that is coming into Scala 3, uh, like the, the new top level run methods annotated with at main. The downside with those is that they're not extensible yet, and so we can't use them uh, as a replacement or a way to launch the Zio app yet, which is unfortunate. But hey, we get some better syntax, which is nice. And then uh, there's a new uh, syntax that is currently very experimental, which is uh, the, the fewer braces syntax, which I just love. Uh, I have to be on like milestone, or no, not even milestone, it's like nightly releases to use it, but it's worth it, it's so good. I mean, look how nice this code looks. It's just, you, you for your functor, you just say colon and then put it in there. Like no braces, it's amazing. And that's on top of like the, the less braces that you already get in, in Scala 3. This is like even less braces. Um, significant indentation, but I think it just looks so nice. Um, so I, I think that that's the, the, uh, one of the reasons why Python has been so popular is that the, the language, when you look at it, you don't have to kind of figure out all these mechanics. I've written a lot of Python and I don't know Python at all. And I hope that Scala 3, the syntax changes that they're making help us get to that type of experience. Okay, so how do we measure this one? Uh, do the simplest thing that could possibly work. So the way that I like to look at this is when someone is trying to accomplish a goal, so back based on the goal that they're trying to accomplish, how many of these things do they need to do to accomplish their goal? How many unrelated tasks, uh, required prerequisites? God, so many stuff, so many things now are like NPM install, whatever. And I'm like, hey, go away, I don't wanna NPM install anything. Um, but it's like so many prerequisites a lot of times. Uh, how many steps, how many like Google searches do people have to do to get to their goal? How many CLI commands, how many clicks, context switches? Like all this stuff just adds up and adds up and adds up and gives people too many places to, to veer off and, and get lost and make mistakes and then end up with all those uh, tabs open to Stack Overflow. Uh, a great way to discover these things is to lead a workshop with technology. When you have somebody who has never used your technology show up with a Windows laptop, all of a sudden you will discover how bad your developer experience is. Um, so that's always fun. 
Okay, third principle is that learning should be incremental. So we start with the simplest thing that could possibly work, but then we try to incrementally build on that. And I'm sure you've seen the, the great comic about drawing an owl um, and, uh, and how this applies to so many programming technologies and how uh, they just make these giant leaps that are not very incremental. So um, I wanna show you a bad example uh, of this. So if I go to start.spring.io and I hit this generate button to generate my project, I get a zip file, but there is no information on what to do with that zip file, what to do next. And so that is a reason why on here, why I put in some instructions, which are not detailed out yet, but I wanna help people know what to do next. Like, okay, great, you got the zip file. Well, you need to get a code editor and open the project in it. Uh, and of course we can provide instructions for VS Code and IntelliJ. You need to be able to run the app, run the tests. You need to know what the code structure is, where things are, and you need to know where to go to learn more. And so this is helping people take that next step. Uh, also a bad example is when I showed you the Cloud Run button uh, of deploying an app from a GitHub repo uh, on the cloud, I did a bad job with that because I didn't give people any information at the end of that experience where to go next. Like, okay, what do you wanna do next? Maybe you wanna set up CI. And Cloud Run Button today doesn't give people any information on what that next step that they should take is or where they can go to learn more. It just drops them like start.spring.io and is like, hey, you're on your own now. Uh, go figure it out. Okay, so we can do better. Um, okay, so what we want to do is make our learning experiences incremental. Uh, I think that applies to, to all sorts of different experiences, whether it's documentation. Um, but I think where, where I'm really kind of interested for me in, in this incremental learning is really around my developer loop. And so I spend a lot of time trying to optimize my developer loop. This is like, like where, uh, how I'm writing code, how I'm testing it, all that kind of stuff. So um, my first, my like tightest circle on my developer loop is my IDE. My IDE is telling me, hey, you did something wrong, uh, that you spelled something wrong, that's not an API that exists there, your types are off, whatever it may be. And you're uh, within, I don't know, uh, 500 milliseconds, you're seeing that feedback from your IDE, hopefully, that is telling you that you have, have made some mistake. So that is my like most inner development loop. Should certainly be under a second in, in that um, respect. And thankfully, we are in a typed language, so we actually can get valid, um, in IntelliJ, mostly valid feedback on what's, uh, what's actually correct. Um, so that is my inner development loop. My next development loop is to continuously run the SPT compiler. And so this is the uh, till they compile or till they run if I'm running the application. And this is just constantly giving me that actual compiler feedback uh, and, and making sure. So it, the, my screen resolution is not anywhere near big enough uh, to show what my local development setup is usually like with like, you know, my tilde compile screen uh, visible, my, uh, which we get to the next one, my tilde test screen visible, my code visible. Like, I wanna be able to see all that stuff all, all at the same time. Uh, so tilde test is my next one where I actually am running my unit tests continuously. In SPT, there's some optimizations. Uh, that you can do like test quick or test only to, to narrow down the test that you want to run continuously. Uh, and so, um, and then you can even uh, with, um, I haven't tried it with actually with Zeo test, but with Scala test and with um, specs too, you can also specify just to run a single uh, actual test within a suite, which is, which I definitely use if I'm working on something very specific. Um, so, uh, so, but that, so my, my inner development loop, like sub second, my compile loop is usually hopefully a couple seconds with a good incremental compiler uh, and compile incremental compilation. Uh, then my test loop is continuously running also. And this one is certainly taking longer, you know, uh, potentially multiple seconds. But then my next one is to run my integration tests. And those are the ones that are using test containers. And this one is taking much longer. And so, um, so I don't, uh, I, I sometimes will run this continuously if I'm like building out the actual implementation uh, for a given layer, something like that. But, uh, but obviously, because it takes longer, trying to not do that as often. 
Uh, okay, and now what is the outer ring of our developer loop, which takes the longest to get feedback? It's production, uh, which we certainly try to move as much as we can out of production for a way to get feedback. But sometimes things break in production and we do have to troubleshoot them. And so all of this is really trying to avoid uh, pushing things into production um, and of course, CI/CD uh, is part of uh, part of that process for how we do that well. But uh, but yeah, uh, I'm probably preaching to the choir on trying to do much more at compile time and with tests. Uh, but this is something that I feel like I, even I can improve on all the time because uh, uh, there are things that are different in production sometimes. I'm like, okay, like uh, like data sizes is one thing that I run into. Like, oh, that thing doesn't fit into memory uh, like it did in development um, on production. So, okay. Um, so in terms of measuring principle three, which is learning should be incremental, I think uh, this is another place where we can ask the user for specific feedback that helps us to optimize just in this one area. So we can ask them, was your, and then some part of the feedback loop as fast as you would like it to be. Uh, I'm sure that many of you work in companies where that inner development loop is nowhere near like sub-second uh, or a couple seconds. Uh, there is many large enterprises that I know of where their development cycle loop is the developers make a change, save, and then like, like 15 minutes later, they're able to actually see if their change was worked or not. And that's like, that's crazy. I don't know how anybody could be productive in, in that. I, if I worked at that company or led that company, I would focus heavily on making my developers more productive and increasing their, their feedback, making their feedback loop much faster. Um, okay, and then uh, other questions we can ask. Did you find the relevant information easily and quickly? Like uh, one of the things I like to do is just like Google for, for um, what someone who's getting started with the technology might Google for and see what comes up. Like, like did the right documentation page come up? If the right documentation page didn't come up, why didn't it come up? What, what was missing? What, um, what was needed? What's needed to, uh, to fix that? Um, so yeah, so I think we can, we can measure this. We can ask people about their experience and make, the, make sure that our learning is incremental. Okay, the fourth and last principle is that wasted time is a waste. I'm, I'm sure you've seen the XKCD comic uh, on, on this one, which is just fantastic. And we used to complain a lot about the Scala compiler being slow, but luckily it's gotten a lot faster and don't hear that as much anymore. Um, so thanks to the Scala team for making it so we can't sword fight as much as we used to. Um, I, man, I didn't realize how much I pick on the Node ecosystem on this one, but this is a, a <laughs> if you've experienced Node, uh, then, then you will understand that there's a lot to pick on there. But, um, but yeah, this is the, the Node module, like uh, just love this tweet because this is, this is just wasting people's time the way <laughs> uh, in, uh, in a lot of ways. So. There's a lot we can improve on. Okay, so what do we want instead? So um, there's some things that I think are pretty exciting that are happening that are helping us waste less time when building stuff. Uh, one of the first is the library ecosystem. I, one of the things I love about the Zio ecosystem is just how many libraries there are that have just sprung up seemingly overnight that fill all sorts of different needs. And so I'm so thankful to all of you that, that build those libraries that I get to benefit from. And, um, and so I think that that is an exciting thing for me to really reduce that. We finally have a great foundation that is able to, uh, to give us pieces that can be plugged together in a good way. Uh, and so we have that, and now we're getting the benefits of that through the library ecosystem. I think that's just awesome. Uh, strict equality in Scala 3 is something that I just love and, and helps me waste less time uh, writing code. And I want to show you this one if you haven't seen it, because uh, it's pretty cool. So I'm going to walk you through some uh, Scala code. So I have a case class something, and I have another thing which has a something. And then I've got my things, and that's just a list of something. And then I've got another thing, and another thing has my something foo in it. I guess I could have reused that one, but that's OK. OK, so uh, does anybody know where the bug is in this code? Do you see it? Uh, so 
what I what I'm wanting to do is filter the things based on my my uh, my thing my something. But another thing is not the something. God, I need better names. These are terrible names. Um, naming is hard. Naming is hard. Okay, I'm comparing unrelated types is the the bug that is underlying here, and I uh, I'm would guess that many of you have run into similar bugs where you accidentally compare types that are unrelated. Uh, and, you know, no compiled information telling you that you're doing something wrong. Uh, it just doesn't work as you would expect. So with Scala 3 now, we can turn on uh, strict equality and we can do this on the whole project with a compiler option. And then what we can do is we can make sure if we go uncomment this line, so that's the same line as before. Now, even IntelliJ is telling me like, hey, uh, you, these things are unrelated, you can't do that. And so we have to now compare the something to the something. Um, the way that we do that is through type classes, derivated type classes. Uh, and so in this case, what we're doing is we are saying that, all right, uh, we need a can equal for something to something. And uh, that allows us to do that equality check. You can tell a case class that it, uh, that it is, we'll, we'll do this for you uh, automatically on the case class using another syntax. But I, wanted, I didn't want to do that on the case class uh, in this case because I want to show you the type class derivation piece of this. Uh, and so you have to then provide the type class for the things that you want to be able to compare. And so this to me is a really great way to save time uh, and uh, not waste so much on bugs that uh, should be caught by the compiler. So I really like the strict equality in Scala 3. Um, okay, uh, another thing to help us save a lot of time is uh, Scala fix. So um, I, I said, don't die like play. And then I saw play just had a release today. Um, so play's not, it plays like, I'm not dead yet. Uh, and uh, it's, it, but it is kind of dead. Um, I, I love play and I've used it a lot. Uh, but play framework kind of uh, destroyed itself by making upgrades very difficult. And thankfully, uh, Kit and Bill and crew have been working on making it easy to upgrade from Z01 to Z02 through Scalafix rules. And so thank you for that. I don't think that Z02 is going to kill Z0 um, so, because it should be easy. I think the challenge will be getting the ecosystem to use it. And hopefully, we can use some of the other developer experience uh, techniques in here to, to help lead people to Scalafix when they go to upgrade. Uh, better compile errors, and uh, God, Kit, you're getting so many calls because you're, you're just amazing, um, but Kit has been doing an amazing job on, on uh, giving us much better, more informational uh, compile error messages in Zio, and I'm so thankful that, for that because the typical developer experience that many of us have is we get a compile error that we don't understand, and then we go search for it on Stack Overflow or wherever, and, but this is the kind of error message that can help you discover the answer without having to go search around for, for the answer um, and not leave your developer experience and get sidetracked on Twitter, which I, happens to me all the time for some reason. Um, okay, so thank you, Kit, and thank you, uh, the rest of you who are helping make the error messages better. Um, we all certainly benefit from that, and um, that's good. Okay, thank let's. You for that you the still the line what is that? <laughs> oh, I just screenshotted your video. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, I just stole from you. I, I just stole your uh, exact, just took it, took it. Yeah, thank you, Kit. Okay, so how do we how do we measure uh, principle four? Wasted time is a waste. Um, so again, it's asking the user, like, hey, did this take longer than it should have? Uh, how much time did you feel you needed versus how much time you actually spent on this? Um, did you feel your time was wasted? Um, and so, yeah, I think that with all of these, the way that we measure the developer experience is to ask people specific questions around those four areas that we can optimize to create better developer experiences. So there we are, the four principles of developer experience. Respect the developer knowledge and goals. Do the simplest thing that could possibly work. Learning should be incremental. And wasted time is a waste. So let's uh, keep those in mind. I'm going to be, as I build out start.zio.dev, I'm going to be trying to embrace these principles. And, and, uh, and we'll see how that goes. 
Um, a couple quick plugs. Uh, Bill, uh, who works at Zyverge and I, and Bruce Eckler are writing a book called Effect Oriented Programming. There's the GitHub URL if you're interested in diving into uh, to reviewing content. We're still pretty early, but check it out. We've, we've got a draft up there of what we're getting started with. So hopefully it's a useful resource to help people get into the world of Effect Oriented Programming. Uh, it's not going to be the in-depth resource that um, other, many others have created, but, um, but should help people get in the door of this new paradigm. Uh, okay, and then um, the source code for start.zo.dev is up on my GitHub, and there is still a bunch of things to do. And so if you want to help, uh, it's up there, and, uh, and maybe tomorrow we'll hack on getting Laminar, getting it moved over to Laminar, since uh, I had to write some JavaScript for this uh, just to hack it out, and I felt ashamed of that. So we'll, we'll replace that with Zio. Okay, and uh, that's all I had. So we have some time for questions. Thank you. Thanks.